Good morning, everyone. It is uh, 8.33 and on uh, Tuesday, January 18th, 2022, this is the Denver Regional Council of Governments meeting of the Regional Transportation Committee. And uh, my name is Kevin Flynn. I'm vice chair of the board. I'm filling in uh, for the chair uh, to, to uh, conduct this meeting. We have a quorum and we will proceed with a call to order. I, de I declare the meeting is open and the second item is public comment. And Cam, do we have anyone who might be raising their hand to offer public comment among the attendees? And if there is someone on the phone, could you uh, tell them how they might do that? Actually, I don't see anybody on the phone. Okay, does anybody want to offer a public comment today? Seeing I don't none? see any hands, oh, sorry. I don't see any hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing none, we will move on to item three, which is the um, meeting summary of uh, last month's meeting. It is in your packet. I don't believe we need any sort of a formal motion, but we just recognize that, the, that those are there. Uh, if anybody has any corrections, they feel free to raise their hands. But uh, otherwise, let's move on to our action items. And Taka Trell, you are going to do the uh, the TIP uh, fiscal year 2021 uh, delays report, correct? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so the current TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases, include, including how to address delays if they do happen. So regardless of the reasons, uh, these delays do tie up the limited funding available to Dr. Cog to allocate. So after the end of federal fiscal year 21 in early October, uh, Dr. Cog requested CDOT and RTD to review the status of those projects with that FY21 funding. And so after confirmation about these project statuses, uh, Dr. Cog staff contacted the sponsors with the project phases that were not initiated uh, and therefore delayed uh, to one, find out the reasons um, their identified FY21 project phase was not initiated, uh, two, uh, to discover the current status of the project, and three, to assist them to develop a plan to initiate that project phase that was delayed. So the attached report summarizes the project phases that were delayed as of October 1st. So overall, this project states that 28 projects are first year delayed, in which two have already been initiated and are no longer delayed. Um, however, so since after the RTC agenda was released, uh, two additional details were discovered. Um, the first is to the Superior US 36 Bikeway Extension Project. Uh, that project did go to add in December on December 30th uh, and therefore is no longer delayed. Uh, and the second is to the Louisville project. Uh, in all likelihood, this will slip one month. Uh, so it will instead advertise in February instead of this month, January. So a motion to approve staff's recommendation this morning, in addition to these two changes to state, just stated, will allow them to continue. Uh, to avoid a second year delay, all of these project phases identified um, in this report must initiate their project phase by July 1st of this year. So just a couple quick observations concerning these delays. Uh, the number of delayed projects is still approximately double versus a normal year. Uh, a major reason behind this project are the delays that uh, took place due to COVID, uh, which we started seeing those delays last year. Uh, so though COVID is not the major reason for the current delays, uh, we still continue to see the, uh, these effects from last year, which really started at the beginning of these project phases. Uh, then when looking at the other details as to why uh, these projects were delayed, and that's besides COVID, uh, there seems to be a fairly equal distribution of the reasons, uh, including right away and or utility issues, um, delays in the IGA process, um, a lack of or an underdevelopment of, of the pre-planning activities or the understanding of the federal aid process, uh, and finally some staffing losses. So at this time, be happy to take any comments or questions that you have on the report. Um, if not, the motion before you is to recommend to the board um, the actions proposed by Dr. Cog's staff regarding TIP project delays for fiscal year 2021. Do we need a move? So move. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Stewart has her hand raised. Oh, I, I was I was muted. I'm sorry. Here I am yakking. 
<laughs> go ahead, Commissioner Stewart. I saw well, your hand. I said, go ahead, Commissioner Stewart. When appropriate, I was going to make the motion, but I would defer okay. to Kate Williams, Director Williams, and I would second her motion. All right. Uh, the motion then is to uh, uh, recommend to the board the uh, actions proposed by Dr. Cog's staff regarding TIP project delays for fiscal year 2021. And it was moved by uh, uh, Director Williams and seconded by Commissioner Stewart. Uh, uh, Director Shaw, go ahead. Thank you. I, I had a comment that um, mm -hmm. I'm very glad that, um, <clears throat> that in the upcoming TIP, we ask people to be uh, better prepared about right of way and those types of things, which clearly have shown to be delays in, in this. So um, I appreciate the learning we've had from uh, this experience and these extensions. Thank you. Uh, Todd, I have uh, just one uh, question. I, I looked through the list uh, yesterday when I was getting ready for this and I was I was uh, curious whether uh, this list is longer, shorter, or about the same as we typically uh, have from year to year. Uh, do you have any idea of that? Um, yeah, so this is approximately double versus a, a normal year. And for the last two years, it has been around that 25 to 30 projects that have been delayed. Uh, historically, 15 to 20 projects are, are delayed. So. Um, and, and again, I think the primary reason really goes back to COVID from last year. A right. lot of projects had a, had problems, obviously, getting started out of the gate on projects, and that that will continue through sort of that life of the project. Because if that initial uh, IGA process or any <laughs> other pre-planning activities um, are delayed, that is certainly going to carry throughout the life of the project, most likely. Thank you. That's exactly what I was expecting to hear. Uh, but it, it's good to see a quantification on the impact uh, that our, our members have been going through the last uh, two years. Um, if there are no other questions, I would ask for a, a voice vote. All in favor of recommending this to the full board, uh, please uh, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed say no. Are there any abstentions? All right, this will go to the board tomorrow. Uh, appreciate it very much. Todd, you're up again. Uh, item five, policy and process for selecting and programming uh, TIP projects for 22 through 27. All right, so let me get the presentation up here. All right, so thank you, everyone. Um, so this presentation um, at the end is going to ask uh, for uh, a couple items to be recommended to uh, the board for tomorrow night. Um, but the remaining part of the presentation really outlines the entire process of how we anticipate to conduct um, not only two calls for projects, regional and sub-regional, but four calls for projects to program funds for uh, the current year all the way out to 2027. Um, so topics today outline the, uh, the five that you see on your screen, um, the TIP policy document, funding programs, um, how we anticipate to actually program um, these funds, um, a brief uh, introduction to the TIP applications, and finally, the anticipated funding. Uh, items one and four are the items that we will eventually come at the end here and ask you to recommend to the Board of Directors. Um, so first, uh, just some very high-level changes that took place to the TIP policy document. Um, one large change that we have made um, overall to the entire document um, historically, we have named the TIP policy according to the TIP that we are actually working on. So um, in a normal cycle, I think this would have been called the 24 to 27 TIP policy. However, we have adjusted the title uh, to reflect more of a document that will um, continuously be uh, in play. Uh, we will still go through the process to amend the uh, TIP policy as we go from tip cycle to tip cycle, um, but we have adjusted this to be called the policies for tip policy development. Um, just being a habit of change, we will probably always refer to this as the tip policy document. Um, but some other items that we have updated along the way um, include the capital project eligibility or the relationship between the current currently adopted 2050 RTP and which projects would be uh, eligible in that document for tip funding. 
Um, we have also updated the TIP set aside programs. Uh, and of course, more in relationship to the TIP applications. Um, previously, there was the TIP focus areas, and we have replaced that with the project and program investment period priorities from the 2050 RTP. Um, a couple of other changes included within um, the actual calls for projects, so the regional share and the sub-regional share. Within the regional share, um, previously the match minimum was 50%. Um, and that has been recommended to be reduced down to 20%. And of course, we've updated the project and program eligibility requirements. Uh, for the sub-regional share beyond the project and program eligibility requirements, we have also updated the funding targets. Uh, this is the targeted percentage that will go to each subdivision or uh, sub-region um, that is further divided from that total of the sub-regional share. Um, next, I just wanted to outline the, the two major sources of our funding programs. Um, the first being the state with the Multimodal Options Fund program. Um, so the 50% match has been retained for this, for this program. However, there has been one major change that we certainly would like to point out. Um, for the FY22 funds and the FY22 funds only, um, these are now federalized with uh, ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, becoming federalized does add a couple of uh, dates that we would certainly like everyone to be um, attention to. So first of all, if you do receive these FY22 funds, um, there is an obligation deadline um, at the end of 2024, and you must have all of your project expenses in and all your billings completed. Basically, your project closed out with seed out or RTD by the end of 2026. Um, the second major source is um, federal funds. So we have, we're con continuing to receive the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality or CMAC funding, uh, Transportation Alternatives or TA funding, uh, STBG, which is Surface Transportation Block Grant. And we certainly would uh, introduce a new program um, that was introduced as part of the new uh, in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was signed back in November. Uh, that is called the Carbon Reduction Program, or CRP. Uh, we believe this will act very similar to how the CMAC program currently acts. Uh, and finally, when the IIJ uh, was, JA was adopted, uh, this included an approximate increase of 25 to 30 percent over the FAST Act or the previous federal bill. Uh, so finally, how do we take this information and go through and run through the actual programming process? Um, so first of all, um, per the currently adopted policy, um, Dr. Cox staff is currently waiting or going through the current waitlist process uh, for FY22 funds. Um, though this process is not complete, uh, we anticipate bringing this to the board um, in March. Uh, we believe there's approximately 20 to 25 million dollars that will utilize that will projects that will be utilizing um, this waitlist funds. Um, second of all, for these upcoming calls for projects, uh, we are splitting this into two tracks using two different applications. Um, the first being the STBG application. Uh, so it will use that funding source and include eligibility for those projects in that funding source. The second is going to be called the air quality and multimodal application. Um, this will combine the remaining funding sources to really help bring down that 50% match requirement uh, that is included within multimodal options fund. Um, and this is primarily, um, again, first being the match assistance as to why we are splitting these um, applications into two. Uh, and second, um, I think as Jacob will explain here on uh, next agenda item, um, we are going through a RTP amendment process and we are attempting to avoid that interaction um, with that amendment process. So how does this really look and play out? Um, so again, there's four calls for projects. The first two calls, um, the first which will kick off here um, this coming Monday, the 24th, um, will be for the current currently adopted 22 to 25 TIP. So we'll start, with all, start off with the regional call for projects and then flow directly into the sub-regional call for projects. Um, these first two calls will use this air quality and multimodal track only. And again, as just mentioned, to, to really avoid that RTP amendment process. The third and fourth calls for projects will be for the new 24 to 27 tip. 
and again, regional call and a sub-regional call. Um, again, this will follow immediately uh, from call number two. So we expect this to begin in September of this year, and we'll be able to conclude this in April of 2023, and then follow directly into the adoption of the document and by August of 2023. These last two calls will use both of these applications. So again, the air quality multimodal application and the STP, STBG track. So just a quick introduction uh, and an outline of the actual TIP applications. Um, again, both of these applications are very similar, but the scoring section is broken down into four sections, A through D. Um, the first section, A, is the regional impact of, of the project. Uh, this has a proposed weighting of 30%. Um, so you'll see questions as they relate to the project importance, um, how to solve, you know, does this project solve a regional or sub-regional problem? How does my project connect to MetroVision? Um, the second section relates to the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan priorities with a proposed weighting of 50%. Um, so certainly you'll see questions in terms of how uh, the project being proposed relates to safety, active transportation, air quality, multimodal mobility, freight in regional transit. Section C is project leveraging. Uh, so this follows a very similar path to previous applications. This has a proposed weighting of 10%. And it basically is you're looking at the level of match beyond the required minimum that is required uh, within the application. Uh, and finally, a new section, project uh, section D with project readiness, with again, a proposed weighting of 10%. Um, and this is really looking at prioritizing the applications uh, to avoid those delays and cost overruns, pitfalls. These are items that applicants are most likely doing already. Uh, we're just trying to capture those and prioritize those, those applications that are looking to avoid these certain cir um, circumstances. Uh, and finally, overall for the scoring, uh, each question is scored on a, on a zero to five. Um, the first two sections, section A and B, um, are going to require a narrative response. Um, there is going to be some required data uh, that is included within some of those questions within those uh, sections A and B. So when we look at the anticipated funding, uh, this is sort of how that shakes out. At this time, we anticipate a total amount of funding of $487 million over that 22 to 27 time period. Um, this is, does not include the FY22 waitlist funding. And again, at this time, we anticipate that be approximately $20 million, um, noting that, that will uh, we'll have to change that slightly. Um, when we break these down into calls one through four, uh, you certainly can see them on your screen there. Um, calls two and four with the sub-regional process breaks that down even further um, within those tables on the right-hand side. Um, so that concludes the presentation that I have for you this morning. Uh, before you is the requested action, uh, which is to move to recommend to the board the draft policies for TIP program development document and the draft air quality slash multimodal and STBG TIP applications. Be happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you, Todd. Uh, do we have questions from anyone? Uh, Ron, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ron Pepstorf, Transportation Planning Director at Dr. Cog. I, for as many of us that have reviewed this document as many times as we have, I was just scrolling through and just noted, uh, just noticed, noticed one change, if I could uh, ask, uh, when when a member is ready to make a motion to include a change on page eight of the document. And it's under the funding assessment section, which is uh, paragraph two, and it's the fourth bullet where we add the new language about the new carbon reduction program funds. The, the beginning of the second line of that bullet says transportation reductions. It should say greenhouse gas emissions so that it would read Federal CRP funds are for projects that support a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Can you pull, is it possible for you to pull that up? I'm looking at it in the packet, but I think I'd like everybody to take a look at that at the same time. Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry for the late <clears throat> The packet, it's the red line, the green line, the blue line. It's, I'm having trouble scrolling through it here. Thank you. Now show us what you're talking about. All right, I'm just going to. 
Excellent. Those two words, transportation reductions, can you see that highlighted? Directly? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that should, the, the transportation reduction should be re replaced with greenhouse gas emissions. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, <laughs> thanks for pointing that out, Ron. That was a, a typo that I think I um, brought up in our last meeting as a board when we considered this. Uh, my question is just uh, because this is, we did review at the, the full Dr. Cog board reviewed this and I did not read it again, word for word. Uh, are there any other changes other than the, the, the changes that were made pursuant to the discussion that we had? Uh, that that we need to take a look at. I'll ask Todd to address that. Um, Go ahead. To my knowledge, Director Levy, all the changes previously discussed have been addressed. Um, and I'm, I'm actually was just kind of scrolling through um, so Ron went through the track changes version. I'm wondering if that was where something accidentally got changed in the, uh, did not get changed in the track changes version, but got changed in the non red line version. And I'll, I'll, I'll note that after the RT, the last RTC meeting, um, Commissioner Hogan had pointed out some kind of wanting some additional language regarding the equity and um, the the actual application forms definitely have that and we sort of uh, added some additional language in the policy document itself to reflect that and, and um, highlight that we felt that was a good and important comment to capture. All right, thank you. Uh, Director Cook, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, quick question, sort of along the lines of the of the substitution. The, does the scoring process or the application information provided now include um, uh, a calculation of the greenhouse gas emissions or a reduction in those emissions? Is that that's the first part of my question. Second is, do we know that information uh, uh, for do we have a per capita uh, calculation for greenhouse gas emissions? Um, by region or by area within, you know, within our region, by the counties. Um, Go ahead, Ron. Sorry. Go ahead. Director Cook, thank you. Thank you for the question. So we don't require a, a specific calculation. At the project level, it's very difficult to do anything with any certainty. We, we have criteria around improving air quality and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And there are some calculations that can be done and some estimates, um, but we don't sort of directly score based on you know how much. It's it's more a relative sort of evaluation uh, when we're when we're looking. We don't have estimates sort of by area. We we are charged under the new greenhouse gas emission reduction rules that the Transportation Commission uh, adopted in December to look at the region, our MPO area, at a system level. And so that, that's what we will continue to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I follow up on that, Ron? Just how, how, do, how then would we quantify on a project basis? How, how would we be able to evaluate that? Yeah, um, Chair Flynn, so there are, there are tools, there are, there are assessments that can estimate, and we've got some, some good history with um, congestion mitigation air quality funded projects. There's a federal CMAC calculator um, to, to kind of assess the impacts of various types of improvements uh, based on what, what the project is, the scope and the scale of the project. So there are, there are tools and, and we've got a lot of data analysis to kind of help applicants estimate um, the impacts of those projects, but they're, they're very much estimates. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Cook, are you back up or is your hand just still up? Thank you. All right. Uh, would any uh, member uh, of the uh, committee care to make a motion? Don't all rush. Oh, there you go. Don't, <laughs> Director don't Shaw, move, go Director Williams. <laughs> I think okay. uh, seconded by, uh, by uh, Director Shaw. Uh, all in favor of the motion, which I don't have on the screen in front of me again, but it was to, uh, let me pull this up. Uh, 
The motion is to uh, recommend approval of documents and actions to initiate the programming of an allocated 22 to 27 fiscal year funding. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. All right, As, are there any abstentions? No, they're not. So this will then also go to the board uh, tomorrow night. Thank you. Uh, Todd, and next up. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, this is Ron. Can I, just for yep. the record, um, note that that included the, um, the wording change on page eight? Uh, Kate, uh, I'm sorry, Director Williams and, uh, and Shaw, is that, a, is that uh, incorporated in your motion, just for the record? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, uh, clarification, Ron, appreciate it. Item six, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee Seniors Special Interest Seat, uh, Jacob Rieger. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager. Yeah, Dr. Cog. So no presentation today, but pulling up the memo just so you can see that for reference. One of the roles of RTC is to approve based on the chair's recommendation, um, what we call the special interest seats on our transportation advisory committee. These are seven seats that have subject matter experts related to transportation and anytime there's a vacancy uh, for one of those seats. Uh, staff will conduct a um, competitive application process, which we've done uh, for this seat, and then make a, rec make a recommendation to our board chair, um, and then ask RTC for approval of that recommendation. In this case, we have a vacancy in our seniors uh, special, special interest seat, um, and the person we're recommending is, her name is Hillary Simmons. She's the executive director of an organization called A Little Help. Um, that organization, if you have not heard of them, is um, a nonprofit group that actually aims to connect older adults with neighbors um, in their neighborhood uh, to help with sort of daily tasks that help uh, keep older adults in their home. So uh, we think she'd be a good representative for this seat. Um, so we are asking for your approval of Hillary Simmons as the TAC special in senior special interest seat uh, representative. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Director Williams. Go ahead. I don't, I don't have a question. I just wanna tell you all that Dr. Mack is deeply involved in this, as Jacob knows, for many years, but our um, staff who had the seat has retired, thank God for her, and um, I didn't think it was at all appropriate that I apply since I'm already over here. So uh, Hillary is great. I've known her for many years. She's very dedicated, and you will appreciate her outlook. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear that. Um, any other questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to confirm the appointment of Hillary Simmons as a senior special interest member on the TAC. Director Levy. Uh, so moved. Thank you. Second, second. Thank you, Director Cook. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. All opposed say, say nay this time instead of no. Uh, and any uh, abstentions? Thank you. Uh, motion passes. This will go to the full board. Um, in honor of the stock show, I suggested saying nay. All right, the next is an informational briefing. Actually, Director Flynn. Uh, Jacob, that's you. And yeah, you so sorry. My, on this. Yeah, so sorry. My apologies, uh, but I guess I'm up anyway. Uh, <laughs> just want to note on the motion that you, the action you just took on the TAC special interest seat, that that actually is one of the very few things that RTC does directly. That does not go to the board. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. Yeah. No, no worries. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Give me just a moment to pull up presentation. Okay, hopefully folks are seeing that in um, presentation mode. Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, and before I jump into this presentation, I do wanna take a moment um, just to introduce one of our new staff members um, on our team. I'd like to introduce Emily Kleinfelter, um, who's just joined us. She is Dr. Cog's first ever dedicated safety and regional vision zero planner. Uh, we're really excited to have her and I want you all to know that she's here and that she oh. looks forward to working with all of you. So I wanted to take that moment while I have the floor. Thank you, welcome. Yeah. 
We're really glad to have her. <clears throat> For today, I wanted to give you all an update on, um, as Todd alluded to earlier, the work that we're going to do on the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan related to the GHG rule. I know some of you have seen this in the County Transportation Forum meetings. Um, I wanted you all to see this, and there's a little bit more detail um, in this presentation than what I've been showing at the County Forum meetings. Um, but for, just to get us all oriented, um, as you all know, the GHG rule was adopted back in uh, December. Um, several requirements for Dr. Cog in that rule, but in particular, uh, we need to review and potentially revise our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, and we need to do that by October 1st of this year. We need to show that the fiscally constrained plan, again, meaning the plan that um, has our uh, sort of cost feasible um, projects and programs and investments that are contained in the plan. We need to demonstrate that the plan meets the emission reduction targets that specified in the GHG rule. And I'll talk about that more uh, in just a moment. Obviously, the, this process is brand new to Dr. Cog with many unknowns. So I'm going to share with you what we think we know kind of at the beginning of the process. But really, the promise is that we're going to work with you hand in hand as we step through uh, the first nine months of 2022 to do this work together. Um, since we're reopening the plan anyway as part of the GHG rule, um, this process also includes an opportunity to propose what we call routine project-based amendments to the plan. Um, anytime we make a change to the plan, GHG rule aside, uh, we have all of our federal requirements that we need to meet anytime we change the plan, particularly around federal air quality conformity um, and again, fiscal constraint. Um, in particular, we're collaborating with CDOT and RTD, but particularly with CDOT, um, as CDOT gets into their upcoming 4P process um, and their targeted review of the 10-year plan, ultimately because whatever changes CDOT makes as part of their 10-year plan, we need to reflect and include in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan because, frankly, it's ultimately the 2050 RTP that's on the hook for the GHG rulemaking in terms of demonstrating GHG compliance within the Dr. Cog region. So obviously, as we get into this, as I've alluded to, close coordination with our board, um, all of you, our committees, and our other stakeholders throughout the, throughout the region um, as we go through this process. Um, I talked about our call for amendments, so I just want to say a couple of words about it. It did close for the most part um, on Friday, um, but again, we had a, we've had a call open for the past month where we were looking for fiscally constrained project changes that really needed to be made um, this year in 2022. Um, typically, we amend the RTP every year in between our federally required every four-year major updates, which is what the 2050 RTP was when we adopted it last April. Um, we opened that solicitation mid-December. We closed it for most of the region on Friday, last Friday, um, but we were giving several jurisdictions in Boulder County another two weeks, um, given the very unfortunate and devastating circumstances that they're dealing with. Uh, so their, their, their deadline is January 28th uh, for any amendments they may have. Um, in terms of our schedule to kind of step through this process, believe it or not, this is actually the simplified version of the schedule. Um, I think in your packet is a more detailed version. Uh, we've tried to plot this out based on what we think we know at the moment, uh, subject to change as we work through this. But um, at the very high level, we've been talking about kind of the blue portion at the top of the schedule um, of the call for amendments. And obviously now staff is going to start uh, reviewing the amendment requests that we've received. As we get into the orange piece of this, this is where we'll be doing the typical analysis that we do every time we amend or update the plan. But obviously, of course, we'll be doing the GHG analysis that's required as well. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment, but uh, suffice to say here that because this is a new process for us and we don't know how many rounds of analysis that we'll need, uh, we've built in, as you see, sort of the idea of you know, several iterative rounds of GHG analysis if we need them um, to be able to demonstrate that the plan um, meets the emission reduction requirements. And then as we get into the sort of yellow portion of the schedule in the summer, spring to summer, um, at this point, based on all that analysis and all that work and the amendments that, that have been received, uh, we'll be updating the 2050 RTP document. The GHG rule also calls for us preparing something called a GHG transportation report. Um, so that's a new product for us and that will be reviewed by the Air Quality Control Commission and by the Transportation Commission. And then depending um, as we step through this analysis, the techniques that we use, the tools in our toolbox, if we need to take advantage of what's a, um, a provided for in the rule known as mitigation measures, if we use those, then we would need to prepare something called the mitigation action plan. That's also a new requirement. That document would also be reviewed by the state agencies. And then finally, as we get into summer in the green portion of the schedule, uh, we'll have been doing public and stakeholder engagement, obviously, throughout the process. 
But again, anytime we make a change to the plan, we have our 30 day public comment period, public hearing in front of our board, um, and then committee and board action. We are calibrating the schedule so that the Dr. Cog board would take action on the revised 2050 RTP at its August meeting uh, to give us the month of September as sort of backup if we need it. Um, but obviously with that, you know, with that kind of schedule, this is really aggressive um, and we recognize that. And again, we're gonna work with all of you as we step through this very aggressive schedule. And then finally, just wanted to say a little bit about what we think we know, you know, at the beginning of this, of this complicated process about the analysis that we'll be undertaking. Um, but we anticipate, you know, very regular updates with you um, as we get into this work and as it evolves over time. But we know that the first step will be to verify the emission results of the adopted 2050 RTP and to test the full set of RTP investments against the emission reduction targets. So we need to establish that baseline and first kind of understand, you know, where are we starting from? And then as we get into the first round of the GHG analysis over the next couple months, uh, we'll be including, of course, any proposed project-based amendments that I spoke about. We'll run our travel demand model, and then CDPHE will run the GHG emissions model uh, for the results for the, for the time periods that are in the GHG rule, as you see there, 2025, 30, 40, and 2015. Determine if the results meet the GHG rule reduction targets from the adopted 2050 RTP for each future year. So again, we're starting with the baseline, we do our first round of analysis, and then we look at sort of the delta or the change uh, for each of the years that are specified in the GHG rule. Um, and then if the first round GHG results don't, you know, if they don't quite get us there, if we still have more work that we need to do, really the point here is again, that iterative process that you saw on the schedule, uh, that we can conduct additional rounds of GHG analysis, and that we have several strategies and tools uh, to meet the reduction targets, depending on you know, sort of how close we are and how, how much we need to deploy. We have modeling tools um, and we have other tools you know, available to us depending you know, what's needed to get us there. So that's all for today. I know it's a little bit of drinking from a fire hydrant, but I did wanna at least sort of make sure that you all saw that and introduce this topic and lay the foundation for our work ahead. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. Do we have any questions from uh, members? Director uh, Levy, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Jacob, uh, I just I had a question as I was reading through the document, and and I can't point to one of your slides, but um, page one hundred and sixty-five of the packet, which is page two of your staff memo on this, where you talk about, so first you're gonna verify the greenhouse gas emission results of the currently adopted RTP. Uh, if that, if it does not show that it, we would meet the greenhouse gas reduction targets, in addition to looking at the uh, program investments in the fiscally constrained RTP, you would look at the conceptual level changes that could provide further greenhouse gas emission reduction benefits. It's, it's that component that I have a question about and how you would evaluate those. Yeah, that's the page. Um, given that they are conceptual and their policy level changes and you know they may or may not go into effect, uh, conceptual policies often change a lot as they're uh, as they become actionable uh, programs and policies. So I, I know, you know, we've looked at the greenhouse gas reduction role ad nauseum on the board of Dr. Cog, but um, I, this is the first I've seen the actual process. I'm wondering about that second point there. Yeah, thank you, Director Levy. Let me try and, and just sort of clarify this a little bit. First, what we're conveying here is shown on the screen, the A, B, and C is, think of it as a little bit of a hierarchy. We start with the you know, easiest things we can do first and work our way up to the harder things. So in part, yes, I do wanna be transparent. There are a lot of tools in the toolbox, at least at this point at the beginning, we have to keep them all on the table, um, but we hope of course to not have to use every single tool um, in the toolbox. It's really gonna depend on how close we get as we start um, getting into the GHG analysis. Um, in particular, though, Director Levy, for the conceptual policy level changes, the conceptual word that really what we're trying to convey there is conceptual in terms of really high level policy, something that's not necessarily super detailed, but something that at a conceptual level, at a very high level, something that would seem to be reasonable. As you know, the GHG rule does have allowances for sort of policy level changes. Really what we're trying to convey here is that we don't wanna ignore that tool in the toolbox. Are there things that we could do you know, at a policy level, at a really high level uh, that would help us get there that aren't 
you know, hopefully super controversial or things that aren't outside the realm of what this reason is already trying to do, but recognizing that it's more than just sort of projects or investments in the plan, that it is one of the tools available to us. And I see Ron has his hand raised, so he may want to chime in on that as well. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jacob. Just just to just to add on to that a little bit, I think probably the inclination is to look at A, B, and C as sort of sequential, and B and C probably aren't sequential. Um, it's 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 going to be a bit of an iterative process, as Jacob has described, and and quite frankly, we're still working through with all of the with all of the partners involved in this around sort of what exactly the process is and the mitigation measures work and the there's work there's work groups working around sort of the modeling and analysis process so there's there's a lot to sort of discover as we collectively work through this process but we don't have time to sort of wait for all of that to work through to actually kick off this process so we're we're going to be in some ways a little bit um building or um fixing the plane while we're flying it and, and just to follow up, uh, I, I realize that and appreciate it. Uh, it. It What jumped out at me is that the other factors here uh, lend themselves to quant being quantified and, and anal analyzed through a model mm -hmm. and policy changes that are still conceptual really don't. So that, that, was, that was the point I wanted to make. Yeah, Director Levy, just to, to put a slightly finer point on that, some of those things we could potentially model. I, I would think any item under B probably are kind of fit under the mitigation measures category, yeah. um, as it's described in the rule, most most likely, not, not necessarily exclusively, but most likely. Um, and, and some of those policy changes we can actually attempt to model. Um, it, if there are land use changes, that folks agree to that there's a commitment to that you might that you might adopt as a mitigation measure there are ways to there are ways to model those some of them maybe not all of them but but certainly um, some of them thank you ron uh, thank you director levy uh, director cook go go ahead yeah thank you uh, quick question uh, and you may have covered this previously or in a, in a different forum so i apologize if so but can you give us i don't even know if this is possible like a a sketch of how the GHG emissions model works. What are the inputs? You know, how do you how do you get your arms around things uh, uh, for the RTP? Um, actually, Ron, can I ask for your help with that one? I I think I could answer that, but uh, would appreciate your help. Sure, Director Cook. Um, let's see. We did a we did a whole presentation to our board as the as we were briefing the board uh, one of several times on the rule but there are I'll, I'll try to boil this down there are essentially three assessment tools we use two of them are housed at Dr. Cog and are part of sort of the travel model process so there's sort of a there's a land use model that we use to estimate growth and development over time um, the outputs of that are become inputs into our travel demand model, um, and the key outputs of the travel demand model are uh, trips, trip making, trip patterns, um, and um, network travel characteristics. And then uh, key outputs from that travel model become inputs into what's called the MOVES model, and the MOVES model um, estimates um, emissions outputs. And, Historically, we use that for our federal air quality conformity determinations. We'll, we'll now also be using the MOVES model to estimate greenhouse gas emissions, um, and that'll be the principal tool to demonstrate whether or not our plan is uh, meeting the greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, I, I hope that helps. That's, a, that's about a 100,000-foot 100, 100, level description of that process. Mr. Chair? Um, I just, I'll go back and listen to the board uh, meeting uh, to get a better understanding, but just a quick question, is VMT sort of the stand-in? Is that the main way you can calculate the GHG emissions? Oh, th thank you. Thank you so much, um, board member Cook. That, um, no, it is, it is an input. It is, it is an input to the MOVES model to help estimate emissions and, and all kinds of emissions, um, but depending, but it's not the only, uh, because it matters, it matters how 
um, how vehicles are traveling on the system. So speeds, and it matters what vehicles are traveling on the system, uh, the vehicle mix, whether they're passenger vehicles or heavy duty vehicles, um, whether they're low emission vehicles. So there's a whole bunch of travel characteristics that are output from the travel model that become inputs to moves. It is not, while there is some correlation between vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions, certainly uh, there are a lot of travel, there are a lot of travel characteristics um, in addition to VMT that really um, help us estimate um, um, overall emissions, including greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Jacob or, or Ron. Um, does this anticipate a scenario uh, where the iterative process just keeps reiterating and the CDPHE uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions model, um, after all the back and forth, uh, still finds that uh, we do not meet the targets? What yeah, happens? Our, our, our hope, uh, Mr. Chair, is that we did build in you know, sort of three iterations in the schedule with the idea being that given that this is a new process, we don't know how close right. we're going to get when we do the first round. So hopefully, you know, after three rounds that we get, uh, that we get there. Um, so we won't know for sure until we start comparing the baseline and see how far away we are. But, um, you know, clearly none of us want this to be an endless iteration. Uh, we've got a lot Certainly. of tools in the toolbox, a lot of which we've talked about today, um, and we hope that some combination of those tools will, will get us there in a pretty efficient manner. Thank you. And I think when you saw when we when you showed us the uh, schedule chart there, the, I noted that the March, April, and May were very very loaded with a significant uh, number of activities. That's going to be a very busy time. Uh, you called it aggressive, and I would agree. Yeah. Uh, so good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any other questions on the presentation? If not, I don't see any. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Appreciate it very much. The next item is other matters by members or member comments. Uh, Director White, go ahead. Uh, good morning, RTC. And I apologize for bringing up an, a question I should have asked during an earlier <laughs> agenda item. Um, but I'm just now uh, realized a, a possible issue to kind of raise. So in, with regard to the multimodal mitigation and options fund dollars, the MMOF, uh, our, our commission has adopted uh, a varying set of match rates that depend on sort of economic conditions in the cities and counties across Colorado. And so the, the rates vary from that 50% that's in the legislation um, all the way down to could be 0%, just, just based on the largely the economics. It looks like Dr. Cog, though, would, is not going that direction and is applying at 50% across the board, even for those cities and counties in the Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog area that CDOT flagged as being eligible for match reduction. I wonder if we could just, if I could get uh, some further information on that so we sort of understand the thinking there. Thank you. It looks like Ron wants to uh, talk to that. Go ahead, Ron. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, so um, we decided not to put that into the TIP policy document itself. We are, we're going to work directly with those um, handful of uh, local agency um, sponsors in the, in the Denver region that are eligible for, um, for those match reductions as adopted by the commission. Okay, and I wonder if it might be helpful to explain that in some of the materials as, as these documents make their way uh, to the board so that, because it was confusing to us once we realized the disconnect and I'm, I'm sure others might find it confusing as well. Yeah, uh, and I appreciate that. We, I think part of the, we're adopting a policy that we expect to have life sort of beyond this particular tip, tip cycle. Um, and so, Given that those match rates may change as data changes, I think there's some provision to revisit those uh, periodically. Um, but again, it, within the Denver within the Denver metro area, there's only a handful of those. So we're our intent is just to work directly with those with those project sponsors um, to allow them to have a, a lower match requirement. I don't think we have any that are zero that are in the MPO area at least. Okay. Well, the the main concern there that there could be a disconnect, um, doesn't appear to be a concern. So I appreciate that. Interesting, thank you. Uh, Todd, did you wanna weigh in on this? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I just did wanna add that the policy 
um, does include a line that says per CDOT action, some local agencies may require less than a 50% match. Um, so yes, Ron is correct that we did not go into a lot of detail, but we did stick a one line at least in um, that does kind of outline that there may be some local agencies that are less at 50, less than 50%. Thank you. Okay, thank uh, you, Mr. Yeah. Chair, for entertaining a, a oh, question certainly. on a prior matter. No, certainly, that's that's a good clarification. I appreciate uh, I appreciate hearing that. I'm sure the other folks do as well. Uh, Executive Director Rex, you had your hand up earlier. Go ahead. I did, sir. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. I, I did want to make it just a couple of acknowledgments. The first, um, we have a new member of the RTC, which is uh, Commissioner Claire Levy. Thank you, Commissioner, for, for your attention to this to this group. I know you're you're busy and really busy right now. So uh, thank yes. you so very much for your attendance at this meeting. Um, just so everybody knows, because it's been a while, probably we had this conversation about the RTC. This is this is not typical to have this type of relationship to the board and to the uh, partner agencies. Um, there's very few, if any, around the country that have the committee set up that we do, that we have a committee specifically designed so that all three partners of the Metropolitan Planning Organization, that being Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, um, have a voice and, um, you know, specifically for, uh, you know, transportation action items that the action of the RTC has to be the same as the action that's ultimately taken by the board. So that is very, very important. Um, that, and, and quite frankly, I think it's kind of cool that we have that relationship. And we also, of course, have other partners on the RTC as well. Um, who provide uh, uh, feedback and, and uh, their stakeholder input. So we really appreciate that. So thank you all, everybody, so very much for your time in, um, in participating in RTC. Um, I would like to also recognize uh, Vince Busick. Um, he, he was, he was uh, selected by his, his peers uh, as the new chair of the RTC board, RTC board, the RTD board. Um, Vince, so congratulations, sir. I know everybody on the RTD board, it's got their work cut out for them, and, um, and, and we appreciate your willingness to step up and, and chair that group, sir. Thanks, Doug, and thanks for the acknowledgement. Yes, congratulations and or condolences, <laughs> as, the <laughs> case, as the case may apply. <laughs> and Mr. Chairman, the last thing I would, I just wanted to mention um, staff real quick and, the, and the, the amount of work and effort that's gone into the two major topics that were talked about today, the tip call, as well as the upcoming RTP update. Um, it's it's gonna be, it's just a stupid, crazy busy year. And yes. um, we're so happy to, to have the staff that we do have and their, their, their dedication and attention to detail, I think is, is, uh, is, is second to none. So thank them very much for their work and, and get some sleep, they're, they're gonna need it. Especially March, April and May. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, members have a comment or a matter to bring up? I see. No, I, I always give time under Zoom for people to find that little hand command, but I don't see anyone. So our next meeting will be February 15. And with no other business before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you very much for attending today. Take care. Thank you. Everyone be safe. Thank you. Thank you.